Hey guys, welcome back to the CNE TV show. Um, I'm joined here with Matt Jasper, um, a fellow cameraman and DOP um, extraordinaire. Um, and uh, welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in the film and TV industry. Well, right now I, uh, am, I run the Jasper Picture Company, which is a production company based in Melbourne and I freelance as a cameraman DOP on anything from uh, feature docs to TVCs to corporate work, uh, TV programs, wh whoever needs me really. Awesome. Uh, where did you get started in the industry? Like, um, did you uh, go to uni or did you have an educational pathway or um, were you doing a practical sort of route? Uh, I probably to go back a little bit further than that. I wanted to be a cameraman when I was five, uh, in grade five. Um, wow. We had, and it's a bit before you were born, but it, we had <laughs> Ash Wednesday bushfires in grade three, uh, yeah. in, in 1983 yeah. in, in Melbourne. And um, the classroom teacher decided that we would make a video uh, about it and everyone had different roles. And uh, I was cameraman. And that was it from that point on. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. So, um, once I got to high school and, uh, you know, did media studies and things in high school, uh, I called all the networks before I finished high school and said, what subject should I be doing? And they said, whatever you want, um, as long as when you finish high school, you come here and sweep the floors and learn that way. So I didn't have a formal training after high school. I um, assisted other camera guys. I'd been shooting weddings for a local guy that ran a production company when I was at high school and debutante balls and, and, and dance concerts and things with a DXC 3000 with a pneumatic <laughs> shoulder porter pack with 20 minute tapes. And uh, so then called myself a sound recordist and uh, bought myself um, some gear, Shure FP 33 and Sennheiser 416 and, and some gear like that and uh, kept assisting people yeah. until I was able to build up a regular amount of sort of broadcast work for myself. Yeah, wow. It was all, all learning on the job and, and more important, I think, than learning what to do is you learn what not to do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, where, so you've spent a long time overseas um, working uh, in some pretty like dangerous environments and quite foreign environments. Um, how did you get into that position and role? Um, like, yeah, tell us a bit about that. In 2000, I shot a uh, documentary for French TV in Taiwan. And uh, on the back of that, I made some contacts within China. And at the, the start of 2003, I was asked to go to Beijing to fill in for three months uh, in the ABC Bureau, uh, the ABC Australia Bureau in Beijing, because the camera guy there had uh, cancer and was getting treatment. And after I arrived, he sadly passed away and then uh, SARS happened. So this isn't my first pandemic. Wow. Although SARS was wow. sort of pandemic light compared to, to Corona. But um, so SARS kicked in. If I had left, the ABC wouldn't have been able to send somebody else in because they were closing borders. Yeah. Uh, at that same time, the Iraq war started the, the, the second second one, so 2003, ABC was sending some crew to Iraq, so they weren't the, the normal sort of swings and roundabouts for the, the crew in Australia. Yeah, so I was wow. offered a, a longer term contract and so stayed with the ABC for three years covering China uh, and then moved to Channel 4 from the UK uh, in 2006 and uh, they covered all of Asia. And then in 2009, moved to their Bangkok bureau where we basically covered all of the Middle East and Asia. That's incredible. That's it. Mm. Yeah, wow. I can't imagine being like a, like a SARS environment. Um, like, like we can sort of compare it to COVID now um, with what we're all going through globally. Um, but yeah, that would have been insane being on like the front line and being... It was, um, it was, it was bizarre in a sense that you know, at the beginning of the SARS pandemic or epidemic, whatever they called it back then, yeah. there was no official SARS in Beijing. Uh, and we went to a press conference one Sunday afternoon. It was meant to be by uh, you know, the Beijing health minister. Uh, and we turned up and his name had been removed from the front and the deputy health minister's name had been put there. 
Wow. And then all of the microphones at the front of the room were covered in condoms. <laughs> and um, How's the audio quality? <laughs> It was fine because we didn't care about that because they announced that uh, eight, there were something like 800 cases of SARS in Beijing that they hadn't reported on. Wow. And that's why the, the health minister wasn't there. He'd been sacked. So it went from zero to 100 in, in the space of a day. And yeah. uh, so everything was locked down. And, um, you know, going to hospital gates to film SARS sufferers turning up and being turned away from hospitals and... Um, you know, film schools would be locked down. There were super spreaders in Beijing that would touch the the ground floor lift button in their building, and then everyone in that building would catch it because they'd press the ground button. Wow! Um, but then it disappeared in the winter. Yeah. How does this like this current pandemic that we're in now compare to like what it was like back then? I mean, it, it's a different disease in that you know it can take two weeks to show its face you know if you catch it it can take yeah. two weeks SARS was a lot quicker I don't remember exactly but it might have been 24 or 48 hours so you know contact tracing two days worth of people is a lot easier than contact tracing 14 days worth of people um, I'm not sure where it sits mortality wise or anything like that but um, back then you know I don't think that you know, it certainly wasn't worldwide. It had got into a few places around the world, certainly Hong Kong, parts of Canada. Yeah. But, um, you know, this, because it has such a big lead time of two weeks, you know, it's just a completely different animal. Yeah, wow. Um, so let's talk about the Middle East. Um, I've seen I've seen photos on your Facebook and your social media before, um, and it seems like a extremely insane, like, place to be to cover um, stories. Um, Tell us, talk, us to, talk to us a little bit about that and what that experience was like working in a, an environment like that. I don't think anything really prepares you for, um, you know, getting caught in a firefight or something like that in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, you know, my first trip to uh, Iraq, you know, we went to Mosul in 2008 and uh, we were caught in a big firefight overnight i was filming in infrared on a um a sony little sony camera that used to be able to, to flick a switch and it would you know that ghostly green image we were filming in the middle yep. of the night and uh you know the, the the army sergeant that we were with said you know there's nobody around you can turn your light on i, di I didn't turn my light on and then the uh four or five people opened fire on us with ak-47 Wow. In the middle of a field. And, you know, you could see the traces going above your head. Um, yeah. You know, they didn't really know where we were until the Americans shot back. Uh, and then they sort of worked out where we were. But I don't, and, you know, and, and, you know, you have a journalist screaming at you, you have the army people screaming at you, there's bullets. You do hostile environment training before yeah. you go on all, any of these sorts of things where you learn whether a bullet is coming towards you or going away by the sound of it. And you do hostage situations and you do first aid, but it's not, it's not, you know, a snake bite first aid. It's yeah. um, a sucking chest wound or, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, somebody's legs being blown off. How do you put on a tourniquet? Yeah. Wow. Um, and, you know, when you're preparing to go to a place like that and you have to prepare a will, uh, yeah. you have to work Jeez. out your blood type <laughs> and you have to work out a proof of life question uh, that if you were ever uh, kidnapped, you know, you would have to answer a question that the kidnappers wouldn't know, you know. So your bosses could say, you know, who was your favourite footy player growing yeah. up? You know, your kidnappers yeah. wouldn't know who yeah. that was. Um, yeah. So you had to come up with things like that. It, it, it got pretty real pretty quickly. Yeah, I can imagine it will be quite crazy. Like, um, I, I guess it would get really real uh, when you'd have to put on a, a combat helmet and uh, a ballistic vest um, to go and do your job. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, part of that, um, you know, when you were in Iraq or Afghanistan, you're always embedded with troops or, um, yeah. you know, you always sort of knew which side you were on, um, I guess. And, you know, there were other situations, you know, we were deported from Sri Lanka or, um, you know, working in different parts of China, perhaps, or, you know, where you'd be detained, where you wouldn't have that support of troops. So, the, and you know, or you were doing a tsunami or a, a lot of the things you would have to see 
and then you would edit them, you know, yeah. so you'd watch the pictures. Again. Yeah, nothing really prepares you for it. Some, some guys and girls live for, um, you know, that combat sort of stuff, but um, I'm glad I did it, but uh, I don't plan to do it again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, what's the one thing that you miss being over, like being over overseas and covering those sort of extreme stories or do you even miss it? Yeah, I, I guess I don't think about it in terms of things that I miss. I, I, I look at the opportunities that I've had since I got back uh, yep. from doing that work. I think, um, you know, life is sometimes like a bucket and sometimes your bucket gets full of one thing and you have to move on to another. And um, yeah. certainly a lot of the, um, you know, a friend of mine said that I should write a book called Armpits of the World because um, you end up visiting some of the worst parts of the planet. Yeah. You know, often the places are fine, but it's what the people are doing within that yeah. space. So, no, it's nothing, you know, I miss, I love living in Beijing. I think, you know, Beijing is, is an incredible city. I, do, I don't miss living in Bangkok as much. Mm -hmm. You know, you can keep 35 degree days every day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but you know, Beijing had a great bunch of expats there and we got to do some great stories and it, it was all, way, all the way up through to the Olympics. So every story we did there wow. you know, actually yeah. mattered, you know, whether yeah. it was in Tibet or Hong Kong or Taiwan or wherever we were. So. Yeah, wow. Um, let's turn to what you're doing now with the Just for yep. Picture company. Um, how did that sort of um, company become a, a part of, um, how did that company, um, Wait, I'll start again. How was that company created um, and, you know, out of what you were doing overseas? Uh, in 2014, I decided to come back home. Yep. Um, and uh, I thought 12 years of phone calls in the middle of the night to go and cover <laughs> some disaster were probably enough. Um, and I had the opportunity uh, to, I'd been offered the opportunity to shoot a Melbourne independent feature film that required a certain kind of um, uh, DOP or camera operator, I guess it was low budget. So lots of lighting with windows and bounce boards. Yeah. Uh, but it also had a component where occasionally the, the actors didn't know what was going to happen. So I would just have to go with the, with the action. Um, and they saw that, having a news and current affairs background that that might be advantageous. So I'd been offered that. I'd also been offered a day a week in second semester teaching uh, or, you know, guest lecturing students at La Trobe Uni um, on how to put a TV show together. Yeah, cool. So yeah, came back, you know, I, I knew that if I came back, I wouldn't have to be scrambling around for, for clients straight away. I knew that I didn't want, I didn't want to have a boss at that point. I yeah. still don't want to have a boss, but you know, yeah. 12 years where you're responding to other people's, you know, you're responding to bosses basically ringing and saying, you've got to get to Pakistan now. Mm. Um, I didn't want that. Uh, I wanted to be doing, you know, I've, I've always worked in film and TV. So I, I knew I wanted to continue doing that. And I wanted to be able to do these bigger projects. Um, but I also knew that as I began, I, I needed to keep money coming in the door. Yeah. And so decided to start a production company and, um, you know, we do everything from, you know, I do some work for NBC Today program or Al Jazeera or uh, still Channel 4 uh, from yeah. the UK as a freelance camera operator. I shot a documentary for a film, Vic, um, Screen Oz. Uh, feature doc, which is going to premiere at the Adelaide Film Festival wow. uh, in a month, which I won't be able to go and see. But um, <laughs> yep. uh, so, yeah, and then the rest of the time we, we have um, some great corporate clients where we do a lot of social media stuff, um, a lot of internal messaging. And I like being able to, um, you know, bring sort of broadcast quality, I guess, and that sort of storytelling, the news and current affairs storytelling to, to corporate work. So how does um, a company like yours evolve? Like how has your company evolved through when you started to sort of where you are now and what sort of client, how have the client, has the clientele sort of changed um, or, um, and what sort of direction are you looking to sort of go in the future? 
Well, I, I guess part of the, re you know, it, it's a bit corny to say it, but, you know, I always wanted to work for clients that I cared about with people and I wanted to work with people I cared about. Yeah. And, um, you know, I started off on my own just in the second bedroom at home. Yeah. Uh, and then picked up a contract for UNICEF, um, wow. which was creating, I think, 14 videos in three different languages out of uh, East Timor. And uh, so I went and did that. And, I, you know, at the end of the three months that it took to put all of that together, I realised that, you know, I had no time to do anything else. Yeah. So I, I, I realised that I had to sort of um, bite the bullet a bit and, and uh, get together perhaps with other like-minded people. And um, so now, you know, there's two of us full time. We, we share an office with another production company Kinney Graffiti, uh, and we work closely with them. Um, you know, making films, making TV is always a collaborative process. It's not just one person. Yeah. Uh, so, and it's great to be able to bounce ideas. And, you know, certainly during something like COVID, it's great to have the support and the, you know, I think it keeps you sane working with other people. So how do you um, go about that, uh, Matt? Like, uh creating a team and finding the right people and creative minds to um, work well together to create something collaboratively? I think for me, it's always been about attitude. Um, yeah. You know, I think I can teach somebody a new skill or I can find somebody to teach them a new skill, but if they have the wrong attitude, then it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't remember who told me, but your CV will get you in the door for your first job, but it's your attitude that's going to keep you there for the second. It's a great quote. And, you know, if I'm not, if I'm going to have to work with, you know, I spent so many years working in small bureaus where it was two, three, four people. And if you don't get along with one of those other people because of their attitude, and it's just, it, it makes, you know, I'd rather go on, you know, I'd rather go and do anything else than, than work with somebody I didn't gel with. So for me, it was all about attitude. Um, it's about keenness. It's about, you know, continuing to knock on my door as often as they, as often as you want to, um, to see if there's any work going. You know, I have a great team of freelancers that I use as well, you know, people that I trust and people that trust me. Um, yeah. And, you know, having that sort of core group of people that I work with, um, you know, means it can be fun too, you know, yeah. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I've worked in enough stressful situations to now just, you know, I, I want to have a business that makes enough money for me to live and to be able to pay staff and, you know, buy all the toys that I want to buy. But I also want to have fun. You know, I don't want it to be a drag. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody works in film or TV, because, you know, who doesn't like the job, you know, um, yeah. I, at least I haven't found someone, but um yeah, for me, it's about attitude. Yeah, cool. So sort of leading on from that question, um, what would you recommend uh, sort of the young people coming through the ranks and um, either graduating or thinking about doing a course that if they're thinking about this career path, um, what would you say, like, what advice would you give them um, to sort of defining their way and navigating their way through um, to where they want to go? Yeah, I think, I mean, I often get phone calls or emails from people that, are, that sort of ask for advice on how they should get a start or, um, and, you know, I can't, I mean, I have a little bit of experience in uh, teaching both at uh, uh, La Trobe and this year I did some work at VCA and Coll Arts. And, but, you know, from my personal experience, I guess I can only speak to that is that, yeah. you know, I was keen, I was willing to learn, um, and I was willing to do the lowliest of low jobs uh, in order to get my foot in the door. And as I said before, keenness and attitude. And, you know, if you can ring local production companies or ring local film companies or local camera operators or, you know, follow them on Instagram and just continually, you know, we all carry a camera around in our back pocket nowadays, continue to shoot things if you want to be a camera operator, if you want to be an editor, download DaVinci Resolve for free and, and be cutting stuff, you know, uh, in your spare time. If you live and breathe cameras or editing or production, you have the right attitude and you're keen and you show others that you are keen. 
uh, then I think that's a great start. And also, you know, there are a lot of great courses you can do um, in Melbourne from, you know, VCA to Deakin to Swinburne. Um, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of great courses out there that people can do. But just remember, even if you're doing the courses, continue to shoot things and you're still going to have the right attitude. You know, you might have a degree at the end of it, but if your attitude sucks, then you're not going to get any work. Yeah, for sure. That's some really great advice, um, Matt. And like, I think um, if one thing that's been really helpful for me has been like YouTube as well, um, LinkedIn, Udemy, Masterclass as well, which, yeah. which is a big one. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's so many like free assets out there. Um, even like, um, yeah, like you mentioned, DaVinci Resolve, like a, a industry quality color grading suite, but also a great editing tool, um, yeah. completely free. So it, there's, all the, all the tools and options are out there for you to go and actively learn. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, absolutely. Too... And, you know, as I said, everyone has a camera in their pocket. If they're exactly, yeah. if they're um, filming, you know, m maybe don't always use the, 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 the generic app that comes with iPhone, have a look around and see if you can get filmic pro so yeah. that you can start doing, you know, a few manual things on the, on the iPhone or whatever phone you've got just so that you can, experiment and you can get, jump on YouTube and you can follow people doing what you're already doing. That's the best way to learn is to, as I said, right at the start, you know, often it's just about, it's often just not just about what you should do, but it's also about what you shouldn't do. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much, uh, Matt, for having a chat with me today. Um, I think it's been some really, like I've, I've, I've knew a tiny bit about like working like ENG style overseas and that, but I think what you've, you know, the insight you've given us has been really valuable and also talking about um, to, to the future people in the industry, um, giving us some great uh, tips and tricks. And I think, you know, it, we're in the middle of coronavirus and we're in the middle of COVID-19 or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week, but communication is one thing that, COVID hasn't killed, you know, so yeah. people are always going to be wanting to tell stories. People are always going to be wanting to go to the movies or, you know, sitting at home on Netflix or watching the news, whichever part of production people want to be in or are in, you know, it's going to come back and it'll be fine. You know, we just got to, you know, stay the course and, and um, hopefully get through the other side. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Matt. And uh, thanks very much guys for watching uh, or listening to this on uh whatever your podcast app is of choice. Um, please keep informed for uh, future episodes coming up. Uh, we've got a great lineup coming through. Um, so keep posted and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Cheers.